just uh, spend some time tonight uh, thinking about your word and thinking through questions that we might have. Uh, God, we do pray that each time we come together as your church and each time that we look into your word and indeed each time we pray that you would speak to us. And so tonight we pray that just as in every situation, in this situation, you would do just that. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I guess the question, this isn't a roll call, but how many of you were at the 8.30 service today? One, oh gracious, okay, the whole gang. Well, uh, then the second question, I'm not even going to ask the second question, 
uh, which was, how many of you actually read the schedule of events for Sunday night? Not many of you. One person. Thank you, Linda, for actually, we, oh, actually other people read it. So listed tonight was our prayer time, if you read it correctly, and, and we, I announced this at 11, but I just messed up. You know, that happens. You make mistakes. We moved it to the end of the month for one reason, um, that, that the persecuted church has asked for corporate prayer at the end of this month for a lot of the, Pastor Abedini and many others. It's a big movement, and we just wanted to stand in solidarity with them. Also, the end of the month concludes our week of prayer for state missions. So it just, you know, it's almost like we make the schedule, but we can change it at any moment. But we will try to let you know, okay, if that happens. So what we did have after these two weeks was Q&A on the book of Revelation. And to be honest, you flooded me with questions, which I appreciate. So we're going to just reverse the schedule. We're going to do two weeks of this and put... Um, to be honest, my heart for the persecuted church, I guess just thinking on Sunday morning, looking at the churches in various situations, every time I look at one, my heart goes out to that one. You know, my heart goes out to the persecuted church, my heart goes out to the dying church, my heart goes out to the compromising church, you know, my heart church goes out to the church and wants the church to be vital. So I do appreciate the submission of questions, by the way, and this is still open. Uh, I... I um, probably won't get through every question that has already been submitted, but please go ahead. I've got one more week, and even if I don't fully answer every question, I could at least talk to you on an individual basis and answer your question um, more fully. So what I'm going to do, uh, I really do want tonight to be a bit more interactive, and next week to be a bit more interactive. Um, I'm, I'm going to go through some of the questions that I've gotten, giving you, give you some answers, but I am being serious. You can also just stop me and say, clarify this. I've got another question. Because most of the time, the way this goes, one question, the answer to one question creates another question. You know, that's the way it goes. So I really want you to um, hit me with questions because actually I really love questions. I like to be stumped. Okay? I really do. You don't, you can't hurt my feelings. So here's one, of the, here's one of the first questions that came up. Now, I wonder if anybody's had this particular question because I have not answered it any Sunday morning that I've been preaching. And to be the reason that I didn't answer it is because I didn't want to get into it because I thought it hijacked the whole sermon or people wouldn't understand it. Has it so the first, has anybody thought this question? I've thought about this question. This was one of the first ones submitted to me. If you notice, in every one of the churches in the book of Revelation, it says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right. <clears throat> so, the question is, who is, um, who is the angel of the church? Now, the answer to this, there are really... There is only, in my opinion, one correct answer to this, but the answer to this question lies more deeply in our view of uh, the spiritual world and even in the context of spiritual warfare. Now, how many of you were here when, I, when at least part of the series that I did, The Christian and Spiritual Conflict? Do you remember that? series, The Christian and Spiritual Conflict, some of you, okay, well, the whole idea was, you know, the Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and high places, you got that text, okay, and so my illustration was <clears throat> with this idea of authorities, authority structures, the same word for authorities, like in uh, Romans 13.1, submit to the authorities, and in that context, the authorities are the governmental authorities. So you have this, this, this perspective in the Bible that authority structures in and of themselves are not bad. You understand? Because the kingdom of God is a structure. You understand that? That's rules of authority with Jesus himself being the king of all the kings. 
So like authority structures aren't bad, although by the way, why well, didn't even get into it on Sunday morning, it's one of those questions that didn't ask. So you have the idea that earthly authorities can either get in collusion with God and his kingdom, or earthly authorities can get in collusion with Satan and his kingdom. You understand this? <clears throat> so, it's not as though either the angelic or the demonic are totally separate. They're kind of some weird little thing happening over here in the, in the New Testament. You understand? They're right on top of and influencing things that happen right now. And so it appears that, that we do know that there were, um, that there were angels for certain localities in the book of Daniel. Because Daniel prays and Michael comes to him, but the prince of Persia, who we realize is a satanic foe, you know, a demon doesn't, and Michael fights against him to get to Daniel for the prayer, if you remember that text. So it appears that in the book of Revelation that my best, Understanding of this is God gives spiritual protection to each church through an angel. Like, it's very possible to me that there is spiritual protection for Liberty Baptist to the angel of the church at Ephesus Wright. So, and, um, and, and that in the, and what are angels? The simple answer to this is angels, the best understanding of this, uh, found in the book of Hebrews, they're called ministering spirits. So think about this. There potentially is, I would say the best interpretation of this phrase is that for Liberty Baptist, God has for us at least one ministering spirit for our encouragement. Well, that's good news, right? You know, and, and this comes each church. So, um, and evidently this angel is responsible for ministry and protection and communication on some level because it's almost as if Jesus speaks to the angel so the angel can somehow keep this message delivered to the church, you know, to the angel of the church at Ephesus, right? So, um, so there you go. That's, uh, that's why I didn't bring that up on Sunday morning, because then people would be focused. There's only one text, by the way. You, so, it, so people have asked the question, what about guardian angels? Well, it appears that there's, there's pretty good evidence for a guardian angel for a church. You understand? If that's, uh, and then there's just this one illusion for guardian angels, if you're interested in that. Matthew 18, verse 10. You can write that down. I don't have it on the screen. It says... In this parable, so you've got to be careful in parables, it says, see that you don't look down on one of these little ones because I tell you that in heaven their angels continually view the face of my Father in heaven. Their angels. So that's your one text. If you're looking for a guardian angel, Matthew 18.10 is close you're going to get. But there's it's a possibility. But it seems that to the angel of the church at Revelation, right, is... Because the church is part of what? The larger, you tell me, kingdom of God. Yeah, body of Christ, but I would say in this, it's part of the larger kingdom of God. You understand? And the church's activities, if done in the power of the Holy Spirit, actually bring in or in some degree, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it would seem reasonable that authority structures in the church would be motivated and ministered to by authority structures in heaven. You see how that would work. The angel of the church in Ephesus, right? You ought to pay attention what I omit in my sermons because that might be where the juicy details are, you know, then you ought to ask me the question and only one person says, you don't tell me what the angels are in Revelation. And I said, very good. And there's a reason I don't bring that up on Sunday morning. Does everybody understand that? Okay. How many of you knew the answer to that question? 
All right, so you see how you've got to kind of get a whole different view of things for that to make sense. Um, all right, no follow-up questions after that. Uh, question number two, <clears throat> how many prophecies remain before Jesus Jesus' return, and it should be not returns, uh, it should just be the word return. So how many prophecies remain? Well, I would say to that question, this. It depends on what you're asking me, okay? Because uh, I have a lot of questions in here in regard to the rapture, so I'm going to answer those as well. But everyone believes in the second coming of Jesus. That's an Orthodox Christian. <clears throat> and the second coming of Jesus is right here, and it comes at the end of the tribulation period. So when you ask me the question, how many prophecies remain before Jesus comes again, do you mean this, or do you mean this? You understand this, okay? If you hold to um, a, a rapture of the church before the tribulation starts, so so those who, because this the same person who put this, I don't know who you are because no, nobody put their name on it. That's okay. Uh, I don't need your name. Um, but it seems like whoever's asking me this question, how many prophecies remain to be fulfilled before this? The answer is zero. Okay, that's what everybody's going to say before the run was zero. However, if you're asking me how many prophecies need to be fulfilled before this, well, quite a few. Like the rise of the Antichrist has to come about, wars have to come about. Um, um, Matthew 24 um, has quite, well, put some things up here. So, yes. Um, so, Matthew 24, which talks about Jesus' is coming. By the way, what everybody agrees is going to happen is this. Not everybody agrees in this. Okay? So, so how many prophecies need to be fulfilled? Well, quite a few. Um, the rise of the Antichrist has to happen. A global war has to break out. A great deception by the Antichrist has to happen. Gospel proclamation has to happen, and a lot of false messiahs have to come up. All of that, by the way, you say, where did you get all of that? Matthew 24. You understand? So, so when you ask that question, you have to clearly state, well, before Jesus' second coming, where he comes to the earth, you understand? He comes to the earth, quite a few things have to happen. Um, one of, the, one of the big ones that is used is this, uh, and this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Now, hear this. How many of you have ever heard this used? Two people, three people, four people, okay. Um, and and, and it, it appears that when this is used, a lot of the times... Um, People use this to spur missions, and you know, all, we don't, only thing we need to spur missions is the Great Commission. You know what I'm saying? Go preach the gospel to all the nations. Period. Some people say, "Well, look, we got to hurry up and evangelize the whole world, because until we evangelize the whole world, until there's no more unreached people groups, then the end can't come." Okay, you're, on one level, I, you're right, but one of the things that we know about the time of the Great Tribulation, and I'm not getting us off the hook, by the way, uh, but one of the things that we know in the book of Revelation is that God himself, and I can pull the text if you want, you can follow up with me on this, God himself sends an angel to preach the gospel to the whole earth during the time of the Tribulation, and then the end comes. I'm not getting us off the hook, by the way, but I also don't like text to be totally yanked out of context. And the second thing is, um, the good news will be proclaimed to the, all the world. Well, in some sense, the gospel has been proclaimed to the whole world. It just hasn't been proclaimed to the whole world right at this particular moment. 
you, you understand how that goes? Like it's gotten around the whole world, like all the people that were on the earth at one time have heard it, but now new people have come to different places and they haven't heard it. So it depends on how exactly you interpret that text. All right? But I'm just saying this one is bears, this one is quoted a lot. And I just you just ought to be able to think through it. Again, I'm not minimizing mission work in the least. I'm I'm answering questions about the book of Revelation. Um, so you understand this. All right, anybody got any follow-up questions on that? You understand how many prophecies? Well, none if you're looking for the rapture. Quite a few if you're looking for the second coming. The rapture is kind of a secret coming where you're gone, you know. That's less clear in the Bible, by the way. That's not nearly as clear as this same Jesus who, who left will come again in the same way, Acts uh, 1, 9, 10, and 11. That's very clear. You know, as Jesus goes up from the Mount of Olives, he's coming right back down like he came. That's the second coming. And before that happens, quite a few things have to happen. All right? Uh, evidently, the same person a asked this next question. Who will be saved after the church is raptured? Well, you got to first of all agree the church is going to be raptured. Not everybody agrees with that. I think the reason that they're asking me this question um, is because there seems to be in some circles this idea that if you've heard the gospel before the rapture, and then the rapture occurs, you're, you can't get saved. How many have heard this? Okay. <laughs> I'll show you where it comes from. I just don't know why popular preachers have gone this direction. Um, I don't see any evidence, by the way. And I'm going to show you that. I'm going to read for you the text that they argue from, and then you have to make up your own mind. But some seem to say if you've heard the gospel and churches, first of all, remember the rapture of the church is somewhat speculative. That's not hard and fast. Not saying it's a bad theory all the way around, but it's, it's not as clear as the second coming. So you got that. So that's already one step. And then the other step is, well, if you've heard the gospel and the church is rapture, you can't get saved after the rapture. I'll show you the text. That's where they get it from. 2 Thessalonians chapter 19 of verses 9, rather not 19, 9, 10, 11, and 12, it talks about the, the coming up of Antichrist. Uh, all of 2 Thessalonians uh, 2 is primarily about end times and Antichrist. It says, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the works of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. So let's just be real slow and careful going through this text. Um, Satan, I mean, the Antichrist is called what? Lawless one. He is a man, he is a lawless one that is in collusion with Satan, some satanic of... Uh, um, here again, what do we have? Another collusion. You understand? The ultimate collusion of the man, antichrist person. Antichrist is not a demon, but he is demonically motivated, satanically motivated and empowered. And this antichrist who is in accordance with Satan is able to do some things, miracle signs and wonders, which has the effect of deception to those who are lost, non-Christians, okay? And those who are deceived because they are lost, they perish, who? The non-saved, you understand this? Because they refuse to love the truth and so to be saved. You understand? I mean, this if you're just plain reading the text, it looks like Antichrist comes up with some false miracles. It deceives them. Um, they won't believe in Jesus. Uh, they refuse to believe in Jesus. You know, it says they perish because they re refuse, you know, so there is a refusal on the part of the listener. No, I don't want to hear this anymore. 
I want to believe this other message. You tracking? <clears throat> and then after a season of refusal, it appears from the par ones perishing, for this reason, God sends them a delusion. And the way this goes in, in salvation is that God gives us an opportunity, a time window to choose him, but after a certain time window closes, God just says, no more. Right? And so it appears that these people had a time window to choose a God, but they refuse, and so God says, okay. And so all, so, and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. Now, that's the text that a lot of popular preachers grab onto and say, see, if you've believed, if you've heard the gospel before the rapture and the rapture comes, you can't hear afterwards. And I don't see that at all. What I do see is if you refuse and refuse and refuse and refuse during the time of tribulation and you don't believe in Jesus and you believe the lies of Antichrist, if you refuse it long enough, God's going to say, okay. So, um, yeah. That's even for now, right? Yeah, right. The same idea is the same. No, not everybody's going to be saved yet. So I don't, I think it's, I mean, I, it's a good scare tactic when you preach, I guess, to say, if you don't believe now, rapture could happen any moment. You don't believe now, you're out. You know, you don't have any more opportunities. And I don't, I mean, maybe that's, maybe that's good altar call. It's just not, it doesn't appear to be good biblical exegesis. And I have, even, I, you know, to mention names, who I have the deepest respect for, like a Tim LaHaye and David Jeremiah hold to this, and I'm just like, I'm with you on so much stuff, but why you keep bringing this one up? I think one of their teachers taught it to them, and I don't know. So there's the text, and that's the one they use, and I think that's why I got the question. All right. Let me get through a few more of these. Um, during the time that Satan is on, it says, during the time that Satan is on the earth, will this be when the Christians are raptured? Yes. You know, I mean, that's, that's because the whole idea is uh, apparently at the rapture, the work of Satan intensifies. You understand? Like, that's when it really heats up during the time of the tribulation, if you put the rapture at the beginning. Okay. All right. Um, oh, good. We're going to finally get to the final rapture question here. I just put them in the order I received them. Uh, what is actually going to happen during the rapture? Well, we don't know. Uh, but, I mean, the idea is a secret coming of Jesus where people are taken away, but kind of mass confusion. That's the way it's put out. Okay. Go watch the Left Behind movie and they'll, they'll show you. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Let's move off the rapture questions. I, I'm just going to answer them as you give them to me. Okay. Uh, what will the new heaven and new earth be like? Um, will it, the question here is, will it be a restoration of planet earth as it is, or will it be, well, they use the word totally new. I would have preferred if they would have put it like this, what will the new heaven and earth be like? Restored old earth or new earth? And my answer could have been yes. But they put totally new, so it kind of messed me up. You know, um, so here's the way it goes. Uh, I will say that some theologians are kind of divided at this point. Uh, redeemed creation or totally new creation. Some seem to say, no, there's a total annihilation of the present earth and the birth of a new one, kind of out of the ashes of the old one. The other one says, no, it's more of a redemption of the present earth. So there's a little bit of tension here. You understand, does God burn this one almost to the ground and then make something totally new, kind of from out of the ashes? Or is it more of a um, redemption of the present earth? Well, we only have one clue here. Beyond Revelation 21 and 22, the only clue that we have is the resurrected body of Jesus. That's the only clue we have on what resurrection, either personal or global, will look like. Because Jesus, 
in his resurrected body, I would say, possessed this quality. Different, but similar. That was the resurrected body of Jesus. For example, I mean, even in the resurrection stories in the end of the Gospels, when Jesus is, in, when Jesus is resurrected in the Gospel of John, and Mary, it says, supposing him to be the gardener. So it could have been that she didn't, wasn't expecting him. That's reasonable, you know. But there seems to be, she doesn't at first see him. Jesus says, Mary, and then she says, Rabboni, teacher. So there, but there seems to be this tension with the resurrected body of Jesus, that he is who he was, but he's different than he was. There's a similarity, but there's a difference. And I would say that, that the new creation has a lot of similar features to the world that God created, but it's different in very unique and wonderful ways. So... I don't know that that's a really the question was restoration totally new. I'd say there are certainly parts of the old world, you understand, that are somehow present, but they have been renovated in such a way as to feel new. All right. Does that, does that help you at all? It's kind of a similarity. It may be a good analogy here. Um, a, a gentleman who used to restore BMWs, you know, that was kind of his thing, and he would take several old parts and a lot of new parts and make himself a BMW. You understand? So you say, was this an old car or a new car? It's kind of both. You know what I'm saying? It's got a lot of the old parts, but it's it's a new car, you understand? So what do you call it, old or new? Well, you, to my opinion, you call it, yes, but even the old parts have been used in such a new way as to make a much nicer vehicle all the way around. All right? Um, I, I will say one more thing about this, just to clarify it. Somehow, by the way, the, the works that have been done throughout history will somehow be remembered in the new heavens and new earth. Like the gates have what on them? The names of the 12 apostles, if you read them. So here's one of the other things. The, the, the stories of our lives that have been lived will somehow fold into and be a part of um, new creation. I, I do appreciate, I think um, many of you have done the study, uh, Randy Alcorn's book called Heaven. He has a great chapter on the end of this where he, he does a good job talking through this. So if you really have another question about this, what will the new earth be like? I think you have a lot there to, um, I think he does a good job making a summary. Um, Follow-up question to this, what will, what will we do on the new heavens, new earth? So here are some questions. Uh, I just asked some questions. Uh, will there be marriage in the new heavens, new earth? Jesus has an answer to that. What will we do? Will there be society? Will there be animals? Will there, will there be arts and sports? All right, so what will we do? Well, I will say that the new heavens, new earth is certainly not you know, sorry, Mark, uh, it won't be a, a long choir practice or whatever some people have, you know, this, uh, amen, right, that wasn't even fun for the music director, uh, so, <laughs> you know, God forbid all eternity doing it, you understand? The whole idea of new heavens and new earth is that we now live out our humanity, a redeemed humanity in a context that is actually conducive to it. If you don't realize this world is really not conducive to living out our humanity. Did you know that? We die, we struggle, everything's falling apart all the time. This is not really a conducive place to live out our humanity, if you haven't noticed. 
everything works against, we work and our work works against us. You understand the thorns and thistles? So this is not a conducive place to live out our humanity. I mean, it's somewhat conducive, but not totally conducive. So some questions here. So that's the ultimate answer here, is what will we do in, in New Heavens, New Earth? Last Sunday at um, the Labor Day picnic, I preached on vocation, you know, working to the glory of God. I think well, in some ways we'll do similarly to what Adam and Eve did. We'll have jobs, we'll do them, uh, we'll care for the earth, it'll be conducive, and we'll, and we'll live, and it will be wonderful. You know, it really will be wonderful. Let me just ask a few, answer a few questions that do come up here. Uh, will there be marriage in eternity? The answer is no, there won't be marriage and giving in marriage. Jesus is clear about that if you want to follow it up, Matthew 22, 30. But one of the things that I do think, and you say, oh boy, this is going to raise a can of worms, uh, is do we will remember who we married? I think the answer is yes. You say, what if I had six wives? Well, uh, you should have thought about that before you did. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, I think the answer to that question is this. Um, do I think we know our past relationships? Sure. Will we know past marriages? I think so. You say, oh, man, well, I can't handle that if she's there uh, or if he's there. You understand? Well, here's the way it would go. All right? Here's the way it would go. The beauty of new heavens and new earth is this, is that forgiveness and reconciliation will be absolute. Now that's, that's the, and you say, well, how could I achieve this? This is my answer to this. I think we'll remember past relationships. You know, when it comes to the issue of forgiveness, we, we, sh we never forget what's happened to us unless we have a brain disease. But we can remember past stories in different ways. I don't know if you're tracking with what I'm saying. And so I think that, that ultimately, even you say, how can I get to a place where even in new heavens and new earth, I could be okay knowing all these other past relationships, is that God is the, the God who can take a wound and turn it into a badge of glory. You understand this? And I believe that the forgiveness and reconciliation can become so absolute because the whole idea in New Heavens, New Earth is not that we are married as husband and wife, but now we're part of the family of God, you understand? And that all wounded relationships are now healed up in Jesus and have been fully reconciled in him. That's why we are to be a community of forgiveness and reconciliation now is because that's where, how he'll sum up all things. Um, and honestly, I have met people who I do believe forgiveness is so absolute on past events that they can maybe not be fully reconciled with the person, but certainly they've done their work for that to truly be passed for them. Well, that's a question. So I've, I'll just put that on the table. Um, what will we do? Live out our humanity in a context conducive to it. Will there be society in eternity? Yes. There's a city, the holy city. So... Um, We'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Will there be animals in eternity? I cannot see why not. I cannot see why not. Uh, even in the millennium, by the way, even in the millennium, and, and Ruth is going to have so many cats and dogs and chickens. Uh, I mean, I know what she's going to do. She's going to pet her dog through all eternity. Uh, it'll be, uh, she's warmed up for it now. She's like, uh, she's St. Francis now. You know, we've got to get her out of the woods. We're in the Holy Land, okay, Ruth? And it's like, and here is the tomb of David. And she's like, oh, look at the kitty cat. It's like, okay, now here is the tomb of David. You understand? It's, it, was, it was not, uh, it's like, you know, it's like, and here is, here is Golgotha. Honey, have you had anything to eat today? It's just like, okay, forget doing this, you know, so... Uh, we're, we're walking the Via Della Rosa and it's like a parakeet. I'm like, yes, it's a parakeet. We're on the Via Della Rosa, you know. I'm like crying the way I'm suffering and she's like, Molly, want a cracker. I mean, it's a, <laughs> I couldn't deal with it. But they'll be in new heavens and new earth. You understand? How God did create them. My goodness. But you know what? 
Jesus said, behold the birds of the air. He feeds them. And I just take him at his word, feed them. Don't bring them to my house so I have to feed them. You understand? <laughs> okay, you're getting me off way off track. Okay, I like animals to a point. Uh, will there be animals in eternity? I can't see why not. This shows I'm an honest biblical interpreter because I could have struck that out, you know. <laughs> Uh, will there be arts and sports? I can't see why not as well on that. Okay? Try to get through maybe one or two more. Um, I might skip that one. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that one, and then we'll go to this one. What is the nature of the millennium? Actually, I'm going to skip that one, too, and I'll come back to it, maybe. Because this one is more connected to my last question. Um, what is the holy city? Who is in it? And then the question here was size limit. If you notice, the holy city actually has measurements. Um, it's the cube city, however you notice it. And so it seems that the, the way this person wrote up this question was this. Um, they were like, well, what is it? Who can go into the holy city? And then why is the size limit there? Because it looks like if that's as big as it is, then not too many people are going to be able to get in it. So let's notice Revelation 21, 2. Now I want you to notice one word, because in Revelation 21, 1, it says, Behold, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. That's what it says in verse 1. And then it says, I also. Okay, so the first way that this kind of was missed was that this was that holy city, new heavens, new earth are one and the same. They're not. The holy city is a part of New heavens, new earth. So, like, here's an artist rendering, okay? It's like, here's new heavens, new earth, and the holy city's coming down, but ultimately the holy city's going to set right on it. You understand? So there's going to be like a holy city on the new heavens, new earth. So you say, so what is it? Well, it's it's... All of our um, all of our you know what what do we strive to do even now? We strive to build cities. Do you not notice this? You know, activity happens in a lot of cities. I know some of you like can't, can't get wait to get out of the cities. That's okay, but the cities still are kind of the centers that do a lot for our nation. You understand? So it's it's interesting how it appears that that the future, where the book of Revelation says we're going, mankind already kind of has a natural inclination to want to do that anyway. And the type of city is a garden city. You understand? I always thought it was interesting when I went to Pennsylvania. You know why they, what they called it? The garden city. You know, somebody was reading the Bible. He didn't know it. I don't think William Penn, uh, you know, but he made a garden city. Well, that's, I would actually say, I'm not saying Pennsylvania is heaven or anything like that, but that's the, God forbid. Um, but this is the idea that we culminate in a garden city. So, um, who's in it? Kind of whoever wants to be in it. Um, and so this is the idea on new heavens, new earth. You can take a stroll into the holy city, take a browse around, and you can take a stroll out and have a go on the new heavens, new earth. Just like I could have a go into Richmond and then I could have a go out of Richmond. You understand? Now, Richmond's not the holy city, but, um, but you see, that's the concept, that there is a holy city on, the, on this larger earth. So, the end of the Bible shows us a redeemed earth with society, with a city on it, Jesus ruling it, and we are his, his people, and we live with him. That's the image. Now, 
I don't know how, I'm concerned that that is not the image in a lot of people's heads of eternity. You understand? But that's like all of our aspirations fulfilled. We get, in essence, you know, what's, um, I, you know, this is kind of, I don't want to bring, although the book of Revelation, quite frankly, has a lot to say about politics because it's kind of a critique of all human institutions. And what, what do people want to promise us? A society, a utopia. We just, we just disagree how we get there. Right? And why is this? Some say it's, well, wish fulfillment. This is what we want, and this is just, you know, there's certainly folks who would go that direction. But could it be that we desire this because we are made in the image of God and we realize instinctively in ourselves that this context and the way we're doing things is not the way it's supposed to be. And this longing, not just in Christians, but in every person, for this new way of being, this new place where we can be, where there's no poor, where there's no struggle, where there is progress, well, that's a lot of progress, you know, where there is urbanization, but it doesn't have all the nastiness of urbanization, but it has all the art, and it has, you understand this? Like, it has all of, it could it not be that the reason we feel this way is because the God of the universe has has now, this is the way we're supposed to be. You understand? This is what we're supposed to long for because it's exactly how we're built. And I would just say that um, not that we don't do what we can as we can, but we have to realize that until King Jesus comes, we're going to struggle. Doesn't mean that we can't make progress. Doesn't mean that we can't do better. And we should do that, and the Christian church ought to be the first ones on the line doing it. And we should be doing it more than anybody because we actually believe that this isn't a wish that may never happen. We believe King Jesus is going to ultimately, finally do it. And so I would just kind of hold this picture up before you and say all that we want, the humanity that we desire for, the context, the type of world we want, the Bible says, not only does God understand it, but Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many rooms in the holy city, in my Father's house that I'm going to build. And if I, and if I go away, I'll come again to, to bring all this about. And so what is our hearts normally? Real troubled, right? Jesus says, I'm going to prepare it, and where I am, you can be also. That's good news. And so maybe we ought to keep all of that. When, when we listen to so many, and boy, isn't this a big deal? There's a lot of conversation that probably happen. You say, you know, the reason you want a world like this is because that's the way the world's, go that's the way the world's supposed to be. And one day King Jesus will do it. And that's the reason we all have this longing is because the very God who made us made us to want that type of context. And um, that's good news. Why don't we pray and we'll be done tonight. Heavenly Father, God, we certainly look for, we look around and we see a lot of folks desiring your world to be a better place. And God, we indeed desire your world to be a better place. And God, you desire your world to be a better place. And God, that's the reason that you came to a cross. You died for us. So not only that we could be redeemed, but all creation could be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of your children. And so God, we, we pray that we would work 
for your kingdom because we do believe that one day all that we desire, all that we long for, will in fact be fulfilled. And God made this church be just a glimpse. As we are obedient to you, may this church just be a glimpse of what it looks like for kingdom people to serve under the king. And God, may this church be a signpost, not unto ourselves, but to a greater reality in a greater kingdom yet to come. And God, I pray every time I think about this, even so come, Lord Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.